Guys, take a look at these beautiful tamales. Now this is a chili con queso tamale. This is cheese and chilies wrapped up in a beautiful corn wrapper. And they are delicious, trust me. You need to try this recipe. <laughs> You're gonna love it. Hey guys, welcome back. And on this episode of Texas Cooking Today, we're going to be making a wonderful tasty treat. And this is perfect for the holidays. This is chili con queso tamales. Now, if you've ever had tamales, you know they're delicious. But how about tamales that are filled with cheese and chilies? Oh man, now that's just stellar and really good. So we're gonna be using a wonderful Mexican cheese in this. We're gonna be putting in some poblanos. You can use other chilies. We're gonna talk about that too. And the flavors that you get from this are just stellar. It's an easy to make tamale recipe. You're gonna love doing it. So I'll tell you what, come over this way. Let's get into these fantastic ingredients that I have here, and let's get on making some chili con queso tamales. Come on over. say get something to enjoy kicking back in the kitchen with whatever it is if you want a, a, a cup of tea a coffee whatever it is just grab something to wet the palate and to be able to kick back with and relax and let's enjoy this experience now making tamales normally as I mentioned before is just huge work but this particular recipe even though you see a lot of ingredients out here this one really isn't that tough to make the hardest part of what we're gonna do here, in my view, is gonna be removing the skin from the chilies. After that's done, the rest of this is just sort of smooth sailing, especially if you have a mixer. If you don't have a mixer, this is gonna be a little bit of arm work, but it's still doable, okay? Now let's get into what ingredients I have sitting out here. First off, I'm gonna start with the wrapper, what goes on the outside of our tamales. You're gonna need some corn husks, all right? Now, in case I forget to mention this later, corn husks have a smooth side and a rough side so you just got to feel them and whichever side is smoother you put that side down and that's what you put your masa on and roll it up so you're gonna need a package of those you're also going to be needing a package uh, of corn masa now this is what they call masa harina this one is a yellow corn masa harina and that means a, a corn flour or dough flour and it's finer, much finer than a um, flour, or excuse me, than cornmeal is. So it's really important that you get the right thing. Over here I have some white corn flour, white masa harina. And I'm going to use half and half, half yellow, half white. It makes a nice mixture, but it's also just what I happen to have on hand. So that's what I'm going to go with. I'm going to use up my white, and I'm going to use some of that yellow. They both have a wonderful, distinct flavor. I think the yellow has a little more robust corn flavor than the white. I think it's a little milder. The cheese that we're going to be using, this is called Oaxaca cheese. Now this is a uh, Mexican string cheese, and it is not the same kind of string cheese that you see here in the United States. This is uh, uh, made just a little bit different. You'll notice it's a little darker color, a little more uh, yellow colored. Um, and it does come apart like a string cheese does. Just, just wonderful, and it's very tasty. Mm. This has a, a remarkably buttery flavor to it. It's a really good cheese. It's lightly salted, somewhat buttery, and it's just great for this dish. If you can, please find Oaxaca cheese. Now, if you need the way you spell that, get ready to get a pen, because here it is, O-A-X-A-C-A. -A -A. Oaxaca is spelled O-A-X-A-C-A. -A -A. Oaxaca cheese, yummy, lends itself perfect to this. Now, if you want to know kind of what it's like, it's sort of like a young Monterey Jack with the characteristics and texture of mozzarella and string cheese. So, 
really, really a cool cheese for this. Down here, what I have is lard. You can use shortening for this also. I like lard because it gives me a little more robust flavor. That's a cup and a half of lard. Yeah, I know it's a lot, but trust me, most all of this cooks out. A little bit of it remains behind just to provide a wonderful texture to the tamale and it locks in moisture. And that's just, it's a very important to it. Now, in addition to this, and let me let, me let you know what we're gonna be using in, in quantities here. That's uh, a total of six cups of masa harina combined between those two. So I'm gonna be using a total of six cups. I have here four cups of chicken broth. You can use vegetable broth also, or just water. Chicken broth, I like it. It's nice and rich and warm in flavor, the same way the lard is. The Oaxaca cheese, I'm gonna be using uh, about two to three pounds. And the same way on these poblanos, two to three pounds of poblanos. You want about the same weight to chilies to, uh, of chilies to cheese, and that way you get a good proportional blend there. I have here some baking powder. This is one tablespoon of baking powder. I'll be using a tablespoon of salt. Uh, I might use a little more than that. I might, I might use like four teaspoons. The cumin I'll be using one tablespoon of, and paprika I'll be using two tablespoons of. So very simple ingredients there. Now you'll notice there's another chili over here. This is a little Hungarian sweet chili. And if you want to include various color of chilies in this, this is the perfect dish to do it with. Because we're gonna have this beautiful wrapper with this white cheese inside of it. And then you can put all kinds of color, which is what makes it a wonderful Christmas uh, tamale. You could do red and green chilies inside of your uh, tamales and you've got a beautiful Christmas cheese tamale. Now. Let's get on with making these guys. First thing we have to do is get the skin off of these poblanos and get them sliced. Once that's been done, we're ready to move right on. Now, before we get started cooking these chilies off, I wanted to mention some of the equipment you're gonna need. You're gonna need a big pot. Now, if you don't have a pot quite as monstrous as this one, that's okay. This one is actually a turkey fryer. It was what it was designed for but I find it lends itself perfect to steaming, mostly because of this basket. I put a couple of pan racks in this pot underneath that basket, and it'll be these two pan racks, and that brings it an inch up off of the bottom of the pan. I can get plenty of water under there, and it makes for a great steamer. Let's get these started. I like to cook chilies off on the stove. You can do them any way you want but I think this is a really cool way to do it. Just put them on your burner. If you have a gas stove, you're the fortunate one. If you have an electric stove, then you're gonna be consigned to A, doing this in your broiler, or you can put it on a grill, do it that way. You can uh, toast them off in a toaster oven. Any way that you can bring direct high heat to this is what you're looking for. And you want to blister the skin on the outside of the chili thereby loosening it and you can wash it off. Do not be afraid of leaving chilies on the fire. One thing I can say about chilies, when it comes to heat, they are very, very durable. So you can put them right in the fire and they're gonna hold up just fine, don't worry about them. And we're wanting it to turn blistered and black, just like this. Look at all this black that we have going on on that and how blistered it is. It's exactly, exactly the condition we're looking for. And I'm gonna show you what I do with areas that I don't get right off on the stove. So keep charring your chilies and get all of them charred. I'm gonna place my chilies on these pan racks when I'm finished charring them. If you're doing yours in a broiler or in a toaster oven or something like that, after your chilies start to blister a little bit, and they don't have to be in there a long time, you just need to get them hot. Then you can put those chilies inside of a plastic bag and in there they will do what's called sweating and that skin will sweat off the outside. So you'll be able to go ahead and remove it easily after it has been sweat in a plastic bag. Put these big ones on back here. I wanted to have a variety of them out here, large and small, so you could see the difference between different size poblanos. Some of them are huge, some of them can be somewhat small, as you see there. 
as these are cooking up, I want to show you another method of scorching these chilies, and this works really, really well. What I have over here is a uh, butane bottle. And this nice little butane bottle here. Excuse me, that's propane. And we are going to use this propane torch to burn off the rest of any skin. All you have to do is just get that torch right up in there. Look how easy that goes. So if you want to do this for the whole chili, you can. However, there is one thing I have to say about that. Now, the one thing I would like to say about doing the chili completely with uh, a torch, and that is that, in my view, it's not the best way. That's because this little process right here, what I'm doing here, actually partially cooks the poblano and it makes them a little easier to handle and work with. So they become pliable, a little bit softer, easier to slice, easier to work with. And so that's one of the reasons I like to do it right on a lot of high heat because it gets it partially cooked. So we're par cooking. Back to scorching. Now guys, you're halfway through the hardest part. Let's take our poblanos, put them under cold water. I'm just going to wash that skin off, and I'm going to tear the crown off, and then rinse any seeds on the inside out, and I'm done. So you see how easy that skin comes off? Once that you have gone ahead and scorched it, it just slides right off of your chilies. Now to open that chili up, this is simple. Push your finger into the side and pull down. Boom. That's how you open a chili. You can stuff it at that point after you clear the seeds out. You would normally pinch the seeds to remove them. In this case, we're simply going to tear back on that crown right at the top there. Isn't that simple? Now, I'm going to tell you a secret. Inside of poblanos, you have these little veins. Do not tear down on the veins if you want to not tear the skin, because it will tear the outer skin. If you want to remove any of those veins, pull up on them, jerk towards the crown, okay? And there it is. That's all there is to removing that skin, seeds, and getting a poblano ready to slice. Isn't that easy? I want to do them all the same way. If you would, do yours the same way, and when you're caught up with me, we'll get started slicing. Now here's part of your cook-along video advantage. You see, on the inside of this chili, there are dark seeds and light seeds. The only way I've ever found to know if a poblano is a hotter poblano chili than others is the color of the seed. It seems that those that have a darker seed have a stronger capsaicin in them. In fact, I feel it burning my throat now, just being in the air next to me. So this one is a little hotter than the last chili I did. And as you notice, it had nothing to do with how old the chili looked or how big it was. It's, I've never figured out why the ones with darker seeds are hotter. Maybe someday I'll learn that. I would love to. From the outside of the chili, I've never been able to determine whether it was going to be a hot one or a mild one. This one has dark seeds in it also. We have these chilies washed, crowned, seeded, and they're just ready to be sliced. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, if you would please take close attention to my hands, what I'm about to do here, the way I'm holding the knife, these two fingers, you know, pinch the blade right here, wrap these other fingers around the base, the reason that is done is to give you roll control on your blade. You don't want the blade doing this. And when you pinch it, you get much better control on it, where it's much more likely to roll in your hand back here. So uh, choke up a little bit and pinch. Now on your hand over here, you do not want your fingers in the way of what you're doing. Don't have your fingers out here like this, because you can cut them. Take those fingers and turn them under like this. This is called the crab technique. It allows this part of the knuckle, this center joint right here, to be vertical and be the guide for the side of the knife. If you notice, nothing's happening to my finger. I'm not cutting it. It's just gliding on that joint, okay? 
that's what you want. And that gives you the ability to control your cuts much better. So just like that, isn't that pretty? So we're gonna do that to all of these. I have to get my chili sliced up. That way we can put them in our tamales, all right? Yeah. I like to throw in extra bits for uh, those that are watching my Cook Along series. Now, the Cook Along shows are specifically designed as tutorials where I'm cooking by your side. So, supposedly you're cooking by my side right now. Let me show you something about this salt. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to take my salt after I measure it, and I'm going to put it right there in a uh, mortar and pestle. And the reason I do this, that's four teaspoons is what I put in there, which is a tablespoon and one teaspoon. Um, the reason I'm doing this is the salt that I like to use is a coarse grain salt. Now normally that coarse grain salt okay to cook with, as you can see very large grains there, but not so hot when it comes to baking. So what I like to do is put it into this. It doesn't take long at all. Look at it now. Look at how much more fine that is. How much more powdery it is. It sticks to your fingers. Now, the advantage to this, the salt becomes much more readily and quickly dispersed within the uh, mixture. So I like to do my salt this way when I'm going to be baking or mixing it into a large amount of ingredients because I want to get a much more even dispersal. It is now time for us to make the masa. That is the part that goes over the, the center of our tamale and makes it kind of hold itself together. And it's basically the dough, you could say. I have all that fat right down in there. So put your fat in here, whether it's going to be lard uh, or if you're using, let's say, vegetable shortening or something else, that's fine. Go ahead and get your fat in there because we need to cream it, just like you would cream it for making cookies. So I'm going to put a paddle on there, not the whisk, not the dough hook, paddle. And then just cream like crazy. Now if you've got a smaller hand mixer, this will work fine. You can do this by hand. Use a spatula, work it against the side of the bowl hard until it gets soft and then use a whisk. You can do that. Creaming by hand is a little harder, it takes a lot of work, but it can be done. It is an incentive to get one of these though. Now that was very short. When you are creamy, what you're trying to do is to soften and work air into the fat. Now what I'm gonna do is knock some of the fats that got knocked up high early on back down into the bowl. I'm just wanting to get a good even mixture there so all you have to do is occasionally reach down in there you know even if you're doing it with a regular hand mixer or other means you're going to occasionally have to get in there with a spatula you know something like this and get it worked off of the bowl so you can get full even uh, combining on your ingredients there now we have it running nice and smooth the fat isn't coming up too high and it will cream it nicely. So I'm gonna give it a few minutes running at this level. Now guys, take a look down in the bowl here. This has gotten nice and soft and it's uh, become very, very workable compared to when it first went in. Now it is looking creamed. It's looking very smooth and, and has a, a shiny, shiny finish to it. So that's just what we're looking for, is that beautiful, shiny glossiness. I'm gonna let it run just a little bit more. It's been running now for about four minutes. It looks good, but I wanna get it just a little bit smoother. And like I said, this is a good thing. It's going to put a little air in it, which helps the uh, tamales rise up a little better. It makes the fat much easier to work with.
this is going to make the fat take in uh, other ingredients a lot easier. This has finished creaming for an extra two minutes. And if you will notice, look down here in our bowl. It has become very shiny, very glossy, stiff peaks. It's holding peaks nicely all over the place, as you can see. And that's just perfect. That's just where I want my lard to be. Right now, it doesn't even look like lard. It looks like something totally different, like frosting or something. And it's beautiful. Now, what I want to start doing is to work the other ingredients into this. And I'm going to begin with our matzah. But let's get just a little bit better view to do that. When it comes to mixing in dry ingredients into something like this, you're going to want to mix them in slowly, not all at once. So get a scoop or something like that that you can handle uh, scooping out whatever it is you're using like this, if it's flour, sugar, or in this case, masa harina, and then slowly adding it in, just gently tapping it. So that's what I'm going to do here, and then in a little while, we'll start slowly working in these other ingredients back here, the spices, our leavening, which is that baking powder, and uh, the salt to bring out a good flavor in this. Let's do this on slow. And I'm going to want to start adding in just a little bit of liquid. And I want to pour this in very slowly. If I pour it in too quickly, it's going to come sloshing out. It'll make a mess. Mixers are good for that sometimes. They can, uh, they can be messy machines, but they can also save you a whole lot of arm work. Your first mixer does not have to be expensive. It doesn't even have to be a stand mixer. You can get a hand mixer and it'll do a wonderful job of this. And some of those are rather inexpensive. I'm getting this beautiful smell from the corn that's coming up from this. It's an absolutely heavenly smell. Now, if you do have a larger mixer like this, I want to forewarn you. Keep fingers and arms and body parts away from the entrance of this. These, these machines right here are quite known for injuring people. They've been known for breaking bones and all kinds of stuff, so give them the respect they are due. I want to shut this off for a moment for the same reason we did earlier. We're going to knock some of this down from the sides. And of course, if you have a mixer, you already know these little rules, but if you're new to them, this is valuable. Because right now, see, I'm pulling fresh white lard off of the sides of the bowl that haven't been touched by any of the masa or anything else. And they need to get down in there. All of it needs to be mixed in there. Now, I can start gently working in some of my other ingredients. Here's the salt. A little bit of this baking powder. Some of that cayenne beautiful red color of it, the dry earthy flavor of the cumin. Now as I decided to develop this recipe, I had some friends try it. They were rather impressed, some of them asking for the recipe. I was very, um, very flattered, frankly. Now back to the smaller bowls. Salt again, and put the rest of it in there. And the same thing on all of the rest of these. From here, it's the machine's job to get it in there. We'll help it a little bit by scraping the sides. Now, the reason we don't put all of the ingredients in there all at once is because if you do that and turn it on, you're gonna have ingredients flying all over the kitchen. So we work them in slowly. These are just tricks that were worked out by good chefs long before any of us showed up here. Just gotta check for the texture now. And again, we're gonna do that with the fingers. Now see how, how, how well it sticks to the skin? That's exactly what I want. I want something that sticks super well to the skin, 
because that means it's also going to stick well to my uh, wrapper. It can't be too soft. You want it to be still fairly firm. Not as hard as cookie dough. Not as soft as a cake batter. <laughs> the next thing we need to take care of is getting our husks into some water. Now you're going to, when you open these up, find some silk in this. And the silk are the little threads that you get when you pull back on the uh, husk of corn. Don't be too flipped out if you see some of that silk up in there. It's pretty much normal in these, uh, when, when you get these. Now, I'm going to take these, put them into a large bowl. I'm going to fill this with hot water. See there? A bunch of silk right there. I'm going to fill this with hot water, and then we're going to soak these. And they only need to soak, you know, for, oh, about 10 or 15 minutes before they're ready to use. There we go. Now, the water that you put this down into does not have to be just blazing hot. If it's good and warm, about the temperature you would take a shower in, what's comfortable on your skin but still hot, that's just perfect. And these will take in water real quick. Now I like to just press them down a little bit to force some of that air out. Pulls water up in between the layers. We'll just give them time. And next is making tamales. Guys, you're gonna need a good workspace, okay? So what you're gonna want is a space where you have your masa and your uh, wrapper the fillings all right at hand and close to where you're going to be putting them in just a little bit. So I have everything right here in handy. I have my pot right back here ready to go. And all I have to do is just get busy assembling these things. Now, so you'll know one of the things I like to do when I'm making these is to use a cutting board that has a groove in it. And this is, you know, normally to catch juices from a roast or whatever or, or something that you've cooked. This is uh, a really neat feature because you're going to be dealing with some wet corn husks, all right? The wet corn husks are going to be leaving water all over this, and it's going to need some place to flow without hitting the floor. And that groove is really handy for that. So that's one thing that you might want to think about when you're starting this. Get everything lined up, and in a moment, we're going to get this started. Okay guys, let's talk a minute about our ingredients before we put these together. Now I've got this cheese, it's called Oaxaca cheese, and it comes like this, like little stringy little ropes. Now Oaxaca cheese is made in the southern tip of Mexico. In Oaxaca, believe it or not, it's good. Mmm, mmm, mmm. It's got this wonderful buttery flavor to it. And it doesn't have too much moisture. And that's one of the advantages in this. If your cheese has too much moisture, it could cause you a problem in making tamales. You want it to be able to kind of, even though it melts, you don't want it to go everywhere. So we need a cheese that works with us. First thing I'm gonna do, I wanna rotate these. Turn my corn husks over. Now corn husks, you're going to find that they have a coarse side and a smooth side and you want to put the smooth side down and I want to show this from two different angles okay so don't sweat that if you have a problem with it rolling up on you the upper part up here not the part closest to you but the part away from you let it roll a little bit just like so down here this is the edge I'm looking to use and I don't want to use all of it I want to use a little patch that's Oh, about half of the total length of it, but not starting at the edge here. I want it to start about an inch back, so about here to here and over. And that way I get a nice tamale, a nice size tamale. There's a lot of ways you can spread your masa. I like to just use a simple spatula like this. Take a good amount, place it right there on top of your corn, and just gently work it across until you have a spread that is about one eighth of an inch thick. If you get a little bit on the board, don't worry about that. You're going to scrape it up in a little bit. It's not going to be a problem. After the matzah is placed on there, 
you want to put your chilies on there. I would say at least three pieces of the of the poblano. I need a piece of this, so I'm going to break off a piece that's long enough. It's about too long. How about I shorten it? Just like so. I'm going to lay him in there. How about I put in some of this? This wonderful little orange chili and another green one. That's a neat way to do it, huh? A little color. It's good for the fall season. That's what I thought. Now, I'm going to fold that over, and what I try to do is to touch the matzah that's on one edge to the matzah that I had laid down in behind it. And thereby, it creates a complete closure. You can just roll that up like so. Now, here's the end of this. Let me show you a trick that a Hispanic friend taught me. He said, if you will fold it away from this, not toward it, that it will hold it closed better. So what you want to do is gently pinch right here until you feel it kind of packing up a little bit, and then fold it away from this. And it holds it closed. Your tamale is shaped beautifully. If the cheese bubbles up a little bit, it will be contained right here in the upper husk, so it won't make a big mess for you. This is a great way to do these. Make your tamales like this, save yourself a little trouble. Now, what's on your board, don't worry about it, just scrape it up and go right into making the next one. Very good. Now let's go at it just a little more here. Some of our masa. Remember, you don't have to put everything on there that you pull out, okay? You're going to be pulling some of it back off. Because we only need, as I mentioned before, about an eighth of an inch. Don't make it too thick. Now there's some extra back here, but that won't matter. Cheese. That's going to be just right. Go ahead and put some chilies in here. Put my cheese on it. Now I'll wrap that moss around it, sealing the edge. Now, if that if extra that pokes through there bothers you, take your finger, pull it off and use it in another tamale. Pull that over, pinch it, fold it back. There's our tamale, all nice and pretty and ready to go. Now sometimes that cheese curves, so if that's the case, you remember you can just break it in several places to get it to straighten out, not a problem. Lay it in there. So as you can see, this uh, Oaxaca cheese it's just sort of the right size automatically. So if you would, just keep making your tamales. This recipe should make, oh, easily a good 30 to 50 tamales, just depending on the uh, amount of cheese that you purchased and everything. But if it was uh, three pounds of cheese and three pounds of uh, uh, chilies, then you should be able to make a substantial number of tamales. Our pot is filled with tamales now. If you don't have a pot this big, hey, I understand. Use something a little smaller. A vegetable steamer and a smaller pot will work just fine. You'll just be doing smaller batches at a time. Now I'm gonna steam these and that's gonna be about one hour in the steaming. You notice how I have the tamales standing on the folded end with the open end up. Exactly the way we want them. You want them just like this and that you can see the ingredients don't come all the way to the top in those and that's important because it does puff up a little bit in there. Remember we have double acting baking powder in that uh, masa and so it's going to puff up a bit. So I'm going to put a half a gallon of hot water in this. I'm going to turn the flame on high and I'm going to give these an hour to steam after it comes up to a steamy condition. It has been one hour now so I have pulled these out and I'm allowing them to cool. Now, normally when I'm cooling tamales, I pull them on out and lay them out sideways on a, a cooling rack. 
But in this case, I want to cool them in a vertical position, at least until that cheese starts to firm up a little bit. I don't want it to flow right out of my tamales the minute I lay them over. So give them a little time, let them cool down. It's just a matter of patience now. Oh yeah, look at that. That is just fantastic. I had a whole bunch of tamales. Look at this. I had about 48 of these guys. Beautiful. Beautiful, delicious tamales. I can't wait. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Yummy. Mm. Mm. Oh man. Oh. Beyond belief. You know, I love chili con queso. Love dipping a chip into it and enjoying it. But now, here is the tamale version. The tamale version of chili con queso and chips. This isn't new, okay? Hispanics have been doing this for a long time. In fact, this is one of the, uh, I've been talking to a lot of my friends and they said this has been for a long time, one of their favorite recipes. And uh, so I've decided, well, I would develop one that, that really tastes good and it's just based on my own recipe. And that's what this is. So I've already tried it out on them. They loved it. Everybody's asking for the recipe. I told them you have to wait till the video. <laughs> That's just the way I am. Guys, thank you very much for watching Texas Cooking Today and for watching this show. If you haven't subscribed, please do. And to some of my subscribers, hey, an extra special thank you to you guys. Thank you very much. And uh, also, if you would, please share the videos. We've got great stuff, and the more that people that watch it, the better it gets. So thank you very much. You folks have a good day. Goodbye. Hey guys, thank you for watching Texas Cooking Today. Do appreciate it. If you would, please subscribe. If you like this, just click like down there. And if you would, I would really appreciate it if you add me to your favorites. Thank you.